Josh, I'm a technical evangelist for Unity, and that's exactly as preachy as it sounds. So I go around and spread the good word about Unity, and like knock on people's doors and be like, hey, have you heard the word about Unity? And it's like a 90-year-old lady, and she's like, like oh yeah, they talk about Unity at my church. And I'm like, not that type. So it's my job at Unity to go around and meet the community. So I cover the area of EMEA, so Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, this is actually my first time in Africa after being at Unity for like three and a half years. Uh, so I'm really glad to be here. And uh, thank you for all being so welcoming as well. It's been really great. Uh, I spent a few days in Cape Town, and, and now we're here. Yeah, and if you want to reach me, that's my Twitter. I don't respond to emails or DMs, as Ben knows. He's been trying to reach me for about two, two months, and uh, I keep forgetting to reply back. Sorry, Ben. Cool. So... I hope everybody in this room knows what or like uses Unity. So hands up who doesn't know what Unity is. Awesome, great. So we all know and love Unity, right? Unity is love and Unity is life. And I say that just even like even because I work there, but I actually love it myself. That's why I decided to join Unity, right? Uh, so it's pretty vital to like everybody's livelihoods and how they make their money, right? It's uh, it's pretty cool. I just want to show you a, a small video about some of the some of the like games that are currently made in Unity and very hard to see. So previously, Unity in the past like 10 to 12 years has, has been kind of like the indie tool and to make 2D and mobile games. And as those years progressed and we've released better and better features, more IPs and bigger studios have jumped onto Unity. So in my time, like nearly four years, three and a half years at Unity, uh, it's kind of gone from this small engine that like one or two people use or people use in their bedrooms to huge IPs such as Transformers and Angry Birds and Pokemon and uh, like Super Mario and Nintendo are using Unity for their for their stuff, which is like the first time they've used external technology, which is pretty amazing. But we're still getting teams of one or two people making these masterpieces, such as this Fox game here, which I was lucky enough to meet one of the creators at Stugan two years ago. And bigger and bigger studios are adopting it, such as EA and King. And it first started out by people working on it in their bedrooms. They're taking their prototypes into work, into the offices there. They said, hey, this tool's really great. And then they started prototyping, still developing stuff in their own engine, but prototyping in Unity. And then finally, they're pushing out and publishing huge content near the Unity, which is really, really amazing. And just to see some of the IPs up there is, is pretty cool. And what's even more amazing, in South Africa, the people that are using Unity. So there's just a, a small selection of uh, the, the studios that are using Unity. Uh, and it's really amazing to, to, to meet some of these in person uh, in their actual own country rather than seeing them at every other conference around the world. There's always one thing that we've been struggling with Unity, though, in the past few years, and that's been helping artists. And like, it, like a lot of you probably learn Unity by yourselves or watching the tutorials online, and you probably realize it's very, very hard to get started, uh, to get like a decent product up there. And artists open up Unity, and they look around and they think, like, wow, what the fuck's going on here? <laughs> and I visit studios all around the world, and I ask them, oh, who's, who's using Unity in your studio? Your artists, your programmers, designers using it? And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We do not let our artists touch the engine. Because the programmers are like, this is our sacred code. This is our sacred place. Nobody's allowed to touch this. And it causes a lot of conflicts in the studio. So then you end up with your artists in, like, one room, like with their uh, coffees and beanies and uh, checkered shirts all the time. And then you've got your programmers in like a deep, dark dungeon, like locked away somewhere, just coding all day in Unity. And then there's like one guy or girl in the middle who's like the, the art director or the technical artist that has to make each person talk to each other and, uh, and kind of cause, like, re resolve those conflicts between the different departments. And that's always been a big issue because we believe Unity is for everybody. And we think everybody should be able to open it up pull in some assets and make something work straight away without having to, to know a lot about the engine or a lot about coding. And that's what we've kind of done in, in Unity 2017.1 and, and dot two, which will be out in like a month or so time. And we've really stepped up the, the, like the power of the rendering of the engine. So I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen the Adam demo, if you haven't, check it out. And this is like a, a short cinematic. And this kind of shows the real-time power of what Unity can do as well as many other engines, but uh, people uh, are now making movies, animations, short stories, not just games, in Unity. Some of the features I want to show today, which we're using the Atom demo, is this timeline. So this is a sequencing tool to sequence uh, things like activation of game objects, animation clips, audio, particles, and you can also script into timeline with custom playables that can use any feature of the engine. 
So you could also put uh, like the navigation system or the lighting system, the rendering system into the timeline and activate different sequences, which is pretty sweet. The next thing we did was purchased uh, an asset software package called Cinemachine. And this is really awesome. This is like a procedural camera system. And you can set up the composition of all your shots in the editor without any code. And then there's also things like free look, uh, like third person settings and dolly systems like you can see here. So I'm going to show you how, how those work today. So yeah, we, we bought the asset and we employed the guys who made it. Adam Myhill, uh, one of the creators, who's our now head of cinematics. And he's really pushing Unity into the space of uh, Unity for, for entertainment, for, for animation, for film, and all different areas. So it's really amazing. And then the last thing I want to show is our new post-processing stuff. So I'm sure many of you have tried this already, uh, but this is V2. And this uh, kind of incorporates a lot of uh, post-processing volumes. So you can actually put a camera in your scene and set up different volumes in different rooms. And you can move your camera through the scene, and it will automatically change between these custom uh, post-processing stacks, rather than having to code them through. So again, I want to show you that works. Uh, this awesome demo, Ghost of a Tale, is a, is a game currently made by like, one guy. Uh, and it's really, really, really amazing game. Follows this mouse around this journey. And he's using so many of those new features, such as the post-processing, the, the timeline stuff, which you can see here, which is very hard to see. And uh, the cinema machine stuff as well. And then we've upgraded our particle system over the last six or so months. Uh, some guys in the UK in my office uh, are there. And uh, they've really added a lot more variables and, and custom stuff into the inspector. So you'd have to code all of this yourself. And again, everything is, can be integrated into Timeline. So this demo is made by one of our South Korea field engineers, Paul Kajiro. And he posts loads of crazy GIFs and shit on Twitter. Uh, he's like a crazy, crazy man. And he, uh, he does like DJ on the side. and and does all of these like cool effects in the background for his DJ sets. Uh, our progressive light mapper. So anybody who's tried light mapping in Unity 5. whatever in uh, Enlighten, know it sucks. And it takes hours to bake. And you'll maybe spend like 30 hours like waiting for a bake to do. And then you'll be like, oh fuck, it, it sucks. I'm gonna rebake it again. And then you'll go off and you'll go watch a few episodes of Game of Thrones, you'll come back, and you'll be like, oh, it looks shit again. So then you'll change the camera again, and you keep continuously like doing that, and it's a waste of time and energy. So the progressive light mapper is a way of uh, iterating the baking process where your camera's actually looking into the scene. So what I'll be doing, say if my camera's focused on just this area alone, it'll start baking this area first, and it'll iterate on the various different resolutions. So it'll start like 125, and work its way up to like 1024, whatever your uh, light map resolution is. And then it'll slowly build out the rest of the scene around you. So it'll only focus on this bit where I'm looking, because this is what I actually want to see first. And it'll build out the light map for the rest of the scene um, after that bit's done. So it's really, really nice. Uh, Unity Teams. So we've kind of incorporated a lot of our services together. Uh, Unity Collaborate, which is kind of like GitHub in the editor. Uh, we've got analytics and cloud build. So you can deploy straight to your devices in the cloud, so you're not locking up the editor again. And it's these kind of workflows that we've gone and met studios. One of my jobs is to, to get a lot of feedback off people, feed it back into the product management and development team, and understand what tools we can make to, to improve that whole workflow between the whole team. Plus, artists and designers hate GitHub and any form of source code stuff. So this is really easy to use. Uh, to, to like keep going on our huge rendering process, we've partnered with Otoy on their Octane renderer. And this is like an offline rendering solution to get really high, uh, high like real-time graphics. Oh, not real-time, uh, like baked graphics, but really, really, really realistic. So it looks really nice. It's really great for VR projects. Uh, many, many, many people come to me and be like, why does uh, my UI keep breaking my entire scene and drawing a lot, of, making a lot of draw calls? So we've created this UI profiler that goes along with the normal profiler. And this is a way to see how your UI is, uh, is breaking its batching. It tells you why. It tells you which uh, animations of your UI have taken up a lot of bandwidth. And it's just a really useful tool. And then in 2017.2, like I say, it'll be out in like three or four weeks. We're working on a 2D tile mapping system. This was actually meant to come out like many years ago. Uh, but we've been reiterating the design of it and making it very nice. So you can do. You can do this, it's like a scriptable tile. So every time you place a tile, it gets the tiles around it 
and it matches those tiles to the uh, to whoever you kind of like told it to, to be around. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. So yeah, 2017.1, I hit PowerPoint, so I'm going to jump into Unity now and show you uh, this demo and how to actually make stuff. So we've just got this marketplace with this punk just stood in an idle position. And what I want to do is use timeline to make a walk up to the coffee cup, up to the table, take a swipe at it, grab it, put it in her pocket, turn around, and then sprint away because she's a bloody punk and she used to steal things. Sweet. So I'm going to go to window, and I will open up my timeline editor. And this is very similar to what you would imagine in any form of uh, software when you've got a timeline sequence. Oops. Oh, damn. There we go. Cool. So this is terrible on a 4 by 3 So I'm going to create an empty game object and call that my timeline. And straight away, I can say I want to add a direct component onto my timeline. So I'm going to call it timeline timeline and replace the same demo that I did the other day. So as you can see here, straight away, I've got my timeline game objects right here. And in my inspector, it creates a Call, a thing called a playable director. And this is what we can override in our code if we wish to, if we wish to incorporate any other feature in Unity. And then we create this custom, the, the playable timeline asset. So that just gets stored in our project folder. And why this is really good, and this, why, the reason why we've done this, is so that we can override uh, and place different timelines on the same player. So for example, if you create a timeline with 10 different tracks for like some animations, such like dancing or walking, and then some audio, such as triggering a victory uh, audio. If you want to add some activations of game objects, you can put that same timeline on, the s on different characters, but just change the animation very so slightly. And they can all share that same timeline, but with different iterations, which is pretty nice. And it creates an animation component onto it, animator component onto it. So I can delete that, and I want to pull on my punk game asset. And it gives me some selections. It says, do you want to create a Cinemachine track, which is our camera system? Do you want to create our activation track, animation, or audio? And I want to create an animation track, because I want to pull in some animations. And we can see our timeline here. So I'm just going to right click and add from an audio clip. And I want to add in a walk forward, so a human walk forward. All right, and then now I can either sample it in the timeline by just pressing play. Or I can press play, and it will actually do it in the game view. But it'll only do it the once. And that's because it's just a short clip. So what I can do, and because this is a thing called an infinity clip, which means because it's uh, it can repeat, once you set up through your like DCC tool, like Maya or Mac, you can just drag it up and make it as big as you want. And again, because I don't want to go into play mode every time, I can literally sample it in the editor like this by just pressing play. Cool. So what I want to do is play a different animation, like a stopping animation, an idle, or just a standing still and swiping at the coffee cup straight after my walk forward script. So I'm going to go to the end of here. I'm going to add another clip. I'll put in idle, so human idle, that one there. So now if I press play, it'll do this. And you can see the timeline actually going up. It's like, oops, gone too far. And it's also reset to the position. And this is for a few reasons. So first of all, I want to make it so that it stops. And I can see where it's actually going. So I want to change my root position to stop there. So I can see uh, this is where it stops. I can move this and make it stop there. The next thing, my humanoid idol because it's just an animation clip, it resets the character to be 0, 0, 0 in the world every single time, which some things it's good for, some things it's bad for, such as this instance. So I want to bring this all the way. Where the hell is my human one? Try that one again. I just love the live demo when things don't work for no reason at all. So I'm going to pull it on here. 
I'm going to make my idle a hell of a lot shorter if it actually lets me. Then I want to add in another animation clip and call that uh, take cup, take object. And again, I can just view this. <coughs> I'm going to right click on my idle animation and then match the offsets of the previous clip. So any of the root motion uh, that it's overrided for in the animation clip, then we can just say, oh, I'm going to offset it. So now it will be from there. And again, I have to do the same for my take object stick. Awesome. Cool. So what I want to do is make the cup disappear at that exact point in my timeline, because that's when the player is swiping for the cup. It should disappear. It should deactivate. So I'm just going to drag my coffee cup game object into my uh, timeline. And again, instead of picking animation, I want to pick activation. So this is a way of turning an object on and off. So that's going to be active from the very start of the scene all of the way until my character takes a swipe at this cup. Not too early, so it needs to be around about there. Sweet. Cool. The next thing I want to do is add in some audio. So I've got uh, an audio source on my character as it is. So I'm just going to go here, and I'm going to right-click, and I'm going to say, I want to add in an audio track. I need to pull in an audio source, which my punk has on it. And then I want to add in an audio clip, which I'm just going to pick this doorbell clip, because I have nothing else good enough. So again, what's really great about the timeline, which I keep mentioning, is you can just demo it in the actual editor without pressing play. So exactly there is when I want to ring my doorbell. One of the main, one a big issue, well not a big issue, but a little thing is that you can't actually sample audio in the editor, you have to actually press play. So they're actually fixing that. So now, my character decides to not do that. So it's just gonna walk up, it's gonna do these animations. My audio should have worked, but it didn't. <laughs> Mainly because, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you from the crowd. Let's try again. Oh, it's all right. I'll just do it through my uh, internal. Oh, yeah, sweet. I plugged in the wrong one. That's why. Watch this be really loud now. Blue Peter style, let me show you what I created earlier. Yay. Evangelists are always prepared. Yes. Anyway, yeah, that should have worked, but oh well. Cool. So that's kind of like how you would do that in Cinema Machine, uh, in Timeline, sorry. And what's really great is that's disappeared now. Well, wait. Here's my other timeline for reference. So what I've done here is actually merged all of the, the clips so you can pull them onto each other. So it won't just change from animation to animation. It'll actually blend between them, which is really, really sweet. So if I press play now, you'll notice that, like that. You'll notice that the animations are a whole lot smoother because they're, uh, they're blended between them. <laughs> And now what she'll do is turn around and run away. All the way through the actual stuff as well. Cool. So yeah, that's kind of how time timeline works with different game objects. And like I say, you can create custom scripts to, uh, to merge different Unity features together, which is really, really nice. The next thing I want to show you is how Cinema Machine works and how it works with timeline.
Yeah, that's right, yeah. So uh, I was meant to have this open anyway, but I'll show you this. So this example here, made by one of my colleagues, is uh, like a really, really advanced version of what I was showing you. So we've got the Cinemachine Freelook camera. We can walk around and we can different, activate different clips. So this, for example, we can wait till you go into the trigger area, and then we can activate the clip in here. And then what we're doing is activating the audio. We're activating different animations. And then we're activating the particle system, we can see here. So we're activating the particle system, we can apply different variables uh, through the system and put them into timeline. This example here, so as soon as I press E, the camera will transition to another place. So you've got both of them in view. And then it accesses the UI system with TextMesh Pro. And again, it's just clips of active game objects from the UI. So then you can use those exposed variables. Yeah, it's already full. And then if I click on my timeline, which is my NPC, I can go to my shark man. And I can go over here. And I can activate him. And you can see in timeline that I have different tracks. So I've got a conversation track. I've got the shark man, punk. And this is all separated into groups. So you just right click and you add a track group. So you can see the different conversations that are happening, turning different scripts on and off through the playable director that I've overridden, and then how the shark man idle and, and plays different animations. So now I want to show you how Cinemachine works. So Cinemachine uh, is a plugin still. Uh, they're working on integrating it into the engine, but right now it's just a freely available plugin. So I'm going to create a virtual camera. And what you'll notice, as soon as I add a virtual camera, then it will create this little icon near my main camera, and it will create a component called a Cinemachine brain on my main camera. And what this is, so every virtual camera is just like a point of reference in the world, just a 3D like game object place in the world. But the, the Cinemachine brain is the main thing that just gets passed around, kind of like a relay baton. So every, every time, they'll just pass uh, a brain to like a different look point. I know it's really great, and it's, it's a lot uh, it's better for performance, because a lot of people who add maybe 10 cameras in their scene, uh, it's, it's not great in Unity, because it caches them all all the time. So this is great, just passing one camera from, from, from uh, virtual camera to virtual camera. So I'm just going to add in a few of these and add different look points and merge between them with my Cinemachine time, uh, my timeline. And what's pretty awesome is when I activate the main one, so the main black camera, and make this my main camera, we can see here in our game view that this is my live camera that I'm currently viewing the, the game through. And I can compose the shot as I wish. So I can either grab the central point, so I'm going to apply something first. Uh, so my in, so I'm going to say my lookout wants to be my punk. So I can set this to be any one of her spines. So I'm going to set this to be, say, spine there. If I start my game, I'm just going to be looking at her. How it's meant to. Again, live demos are the best. Da, da, da. I'm overriding it somewhere. Cool. Well, I'll show you this way instead. So I've got my various look cameras. I'm going to activate this one. And you can see in my scene that I've composed it to be looking at the player at a neck. And I've got the rest of my scene in the shot. I can grab this yellow dot and move how the camera is going to be. So if I want to use my rule of threes, which is standard photography practice, I read about it on Wikipedia once. Uh, you can say, oh, I want her to be this, so I can see the rest of my scene. You don't want your camera to be facing this way because you're not actually active in, in that area. 
So I'm going to place her here because I know that she's going to be walking across the seam into the coffee cup. And this like very clear area here, which is around her head, this is kind of the area which she's allowed to move in before my camera starts to move. So I can move this really tight, like this. And that'll mean when I press play and start to move her, look, as soon as that yellow dot touches the blue line, then it'll start following it instantly. I can make it a bit wider, and it will start moving until she's actually there. So let me just press play, and you'll be able to see how that works. So the camera will start moving until it reaches that point. So if I set it to be really tight, then it'll start moving instantly. And what's really cool as well, in my aim for things, I can say how much I want my damping to be. So this is currently one. So basically, it takes one second as soon as that yellow dot leaves the blue area or leaves the clear area into the blue area. So it'll take one second for it to catch up. If I change this to be six, for example, and then press play, then the camera will move a hell of a lot slower. It takes six seconds for it to catch up. If I make this red area super tight, which is the hard limit, the camera will just start moving instantly and just snap to that. And it won't be able to get out of that red area. So as soon as she starts turning and running, it's going to be a really hard limit, so it'll stay with it forever. And there's a whole lot more settings with Cinema Machine, but that's just uh, one of the things I want to show you. Let's change that hard limit. Cool. And then in my timeline, I'm going to create a Cinema Machine track. Right click, Cinema Machine timeline, Cinema Machine track. And I'm going to try blend between the different cameras. So here's my V camera one. It lets me do it. Okay, just for a moment. Oops, created a brain. So I want to say which virtual camera do I want to have? I want to create some more Cinema Machine short clips like this. And say I want to focus on V2, I want to focus on V3. And this activates them as well. So I'm going to set up my V2 camera, say, looking over here, so we can zoom like that. And I'm going to set up my V3 camera, yeah, that's good. So in my timeline, it should basically swap between them. Should do if it uh, you want to do it. Great. They just love it thing things go wrong. Cool. Right. Let's remove that. Great. So yeah, what should have happened is it should have gone between them all, but don't feel like working today. And the next thing I wanted to show is how you do the free look break. So this is basically uh, a full 3D, so three cameras all in one, and you create this uh, thing called a free look camera. So Cinema Machine, create free look camera. And what you can do is, whoa. Cinema Machine, create free look. And I want to say what it's currently looking at. So I want to look at my punk. And I want it to follow also the punk as well. So you can see these red rings around uh, the character. And this is three different camera rigs all working together. So if I press play and get my camera to move around and remove all of my other crazy cameras. So 
that should happen is more flowing. Is I can move this character around, and when I move my mouse up, it will follow where she's going and around. And part of Cinema Machine allows you to focus at different points of her body, depending on which ring you actually have active. So I've created some look points. Look point feet, upper spine, and head. And I've got some variables here for top rig, middle rig, and bottom rig. So all I want to do is say my look point for the top rig, I want it to be feet, look point feet. Middle, I want it to be the spine. And then the bottom rig, I want that to be the head. And now, when I move around, if I look really far up, then it's going to focus on her feet. When I go all the way down, it's going to focus on her head. So this is a really, really quick way to get a really nice camera rig system working in your game. And obviously, there's a lot more custom variables and all different things that you could tweak and change to, to work for your game. And what you can also do is trigger different states depending on which ring your camera mainly is at. So if I split this together, what have I done there? In my scene view at the bottom, you can see the actual camera moving and swinging around. So what I could do is activate a state of when my camera is really high up, I could set it to be crouching or trigger a different animation. When she's further down like this, I can make her run faster all different things and triggering different states. Again, with no code at all. It's really sweet. The next thing on Cinema Machine I want to show you is how the dolly track system works. So again, you go on Cinema Machine and you go on Create Dolly Camera with Track. And what this creates is a thing like this, a dolly track system. And you can get a camera to move along this dolly track. And you can constantly add different things and make it as you wish. So I'm going to just click on my dolly track, which shows you like this. And I'm going to add some different points. So I'll just remove a few that I've previously created. Cool. So I need to add in a few more again, because it's back to what it was. So I just Add on this, fullest view, the timeline. You just go on Cinema Machine, create Dolly Camera, and then you create this. And then these are all of your waypoints in the world, your path details. And you just add that plus. And then from there, you can just move it around in the gizmo view of how you wish. I can put like a roller coaster drop. So the first one is where the actual point will be. And the next point is where the uh, rotation will be. I might create it really high again, but then move it round. And this is really, really simple to do in the editor. Cool. And I'll make it drop down. This is a pretty sweet roller coaster. Great. And then my camera is just attached to this. So I've got my dolly track, which is a cinema, cinema machine path. And I've got my dolly timeline, which has my playable director, blah, blah, blah. I've got my free look camera on there, which I don't need now. And I want to add my B4 cam on it. Yeah. So my virtual camera 4 is part of the dolly track system. As you can see, because I've added a body called track dolly, and this is my path position. And to make it go along the full dolly track is just changing the variable of that path position. So if I click this now and move this variable, then the path position will just change. So it's just literally animating one float value, and it will follow along. And what should happen, is because I set up earlier on in timeline, is this should move. Dolly track position. 
So as soon as I just start changing that in my game view, it starts following all of those crazy movements that I put in. It's super, super simple to compose your own shots and give you that artistic freedom that normally you'd maybe have to do with animation clips or doing it with code, like giving it points to spline through. I'm doing not too bad for time. The next thing I wanted to show you is the post-processing stack. So like I say, this is our V2. I'm sure a lot of you have tried V1. V2 has been out for maybe a month or so on our GitHub. Uh, so just look on Google and type in Unity post-processing stack and you'll find it. And this is a really, really awesome way of creating uh, uh, nice post-processing features and blending between them for different volumes. So what I've done here is create some earlier on. So I've created this short corridor here, I've created my fish stand, and I've created this long corridor. And I've set up different profiles for each one. So in my uh, scrolling volumes, what I did was I took my camera, which is my post effects camera here, and I added a component called post processing layer. And I said I want it to be this camera, and I created a layer called post effects. And that's really great to do instead of having everything as on a post processing layer. And then you can select which anti-aliasing you want. I went for TAA because my MacBook is not that powerful. And then I've just added my CinemaChine stuff and brains and whatnot. What's really cool is you can add in like ambient occlusion and you can add and export your, uh, in this like toolkit section here, you can export the actual frame to an EXR so you can import that into Photoshop and then bring it back into Unity. So, so for uh, doing stuff like ambient occlusion and other effects that you might want. And then, We've got this pro processing game object, which basically is a box collider with a trigger. And then I added a script called post processing volume. And the first thing I did was create a global volume. So this interacts with everywhere in your scene. So you don't want it to be too intense on your post processing. So I've set up a little bit of bloom, a little bit of depth of field, a bit of vignetting. And these are all just like drop downs in the Unity thing. So I can just go and add effects, Unity, and I'll say, oh, what do I want? So I want some motion blur, or I've already got the other ones in, that's why they're grayed out. And then you can just play around with sliders and variables to your heart's content. So if I want to change my post effects, turn it on, and turn off my one there. So you can see there, as soon as I change that, you can see the vignetting. We can say what intensity I want it to be. So I'm going to say I want it like super intense, like shit, things like this. Let's change some depth of field, how that's going to look. Cool, very blurry. So again, you could just animate that variable in timeline or in animation to, to change as you wish. Uh, let's add in some bloom, some super intense bloom. Cool. So that's my global script now. So that will appear every, everywhere. So then I've set up this small corridor. I've set up my fish stand like this. And let me just turn the blending distance off of both of those. And what I can do is just add on all different things, such as color grading and all of the other stuff, just in that area. So as soon as my camera enters that area, that will override everything else, depending on the priority and the weight. So I can say, oh, I only want this to be 50% or 100%. I want this to have a high priority. So if you're going into a dungeon uh, and it wants to override everything, you want it to be high priority, or your global just wants to be a zero, and everything else will override that. And then when I move my camera into this area, so I'm hoping that it's on, where is my post effects camera? My post effects camera is still on the dolly track, so I can move it in here. So that's inside there now. I'm just going to move it outside ever so slightly, and I'm going to bring in my scene view here. So what will happen is when I bring it in, you can see how it instantly changes. And that's because it's just overriding everything in that volume from the global, global settings. So what I'm going to do is in my fish stand game objects, I'm going to set the blending distance. And when I change this variable, you can see the extra green lines around the volume change. So I'm just going to make it quite a bit bigger. And then I'm going to move my camera a bit further out. 
And you can see that as I enter the blending distance and into the full volume, it just slowly changes. So it looks like it's animating between them. And you can do that with multiple volumes and override the blending for each one. So you're passing through different blend areas, which I will do as I go through these two here. So I've got my main corridor, and I'm going to add a big blend distance on that as well. And then let's say override each other there. So when I pass my camera through, my post effects camera, it'll go to that one and it'll start blending over to this one. Yeah, it's obviously going to suffer a lot from frame rate because any post post processing is is dire for that. So you kind of have to be mindful of first of all when you're blending between them because that's two stacks laid on top of each other. But then it also, like, kind of in the background, it creates one stack for both of them on. But again, if you're passing through stacks, then you could have frame rate drops in that area because of, like, the sudden, like, change or trigger of, like, high-intensity bloom or changing the anti-aliasing or something like that. So. But, yeah, it's really sweet. And it's, uh, again, all of these features are, like, near enough codeless. Like, sometimes you maybe have to set triggers or try and activate something or try just to animate one variable. But, like... To create this normally, we'd create like shit ton of code and a lot of engineering, and uh, it's kind of all done for you now. Cool. So that's all I have time for, really. And if there's any questions, feel free to meet me outside, and I'm gonna be around until like Saturday evening. Um, feel free to reach out anytime. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. I hope you find it useful.